Welcome to A Flame for Christ, homilies to set your heart on fire with the love of Jesus Christ. My name is Father Joseph Gill, priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you've joined us on this seventh Sunday of Easter. The British journalist Malcolm Muggeridge didn't really care much about religion, which is why he thought it a little strange that he received the assignment to travel to India to do a cover story about some obscure Albanian nun named Mother Teresa. Reluctantly, he went on assignment, but he ended up becoming friends with the future saint. And after a couple of years of following her around, he ended up writing her biography, and he converted to Catholicism. And he once wrote of Mother Teresa, he said, She is in herself a living conversion. It's impossible to be with her, to listen to her, to observe what she's doing without being converted. I think that's a pretty profound testimony about a woman who lived completely for the glory of God. You know, we hear a lot about the glory of God in today's gospel. Jesus, for example, asks the Father to glorify him. And St. Peter tells us to glorify God when we suffer for his name. But what is this glory of God? It's a term we throw out in church quite a bit. But what does it mean? Well, you know, we usually think of glory as just praise, but actually glory is more than that. Glory, really, is the manifestation of greatness, splendor, and majesty. I think the best secular example I can come up with is the recent coronation of King Charles of England. And there really was so much pomp and circumstance, fancy robes and gold and jewels. But why? Well, it's to show the greatness not just of a man, but of a man who embodies the entire country of England. They wanted to make it spectacular because they believe their country is great and splendid and amazing. So when we talk about the glory of God, we're talking about how God manifests his glory, his greatness, his splendor. So where do we see God's glory? Well, I think first in nature. It's absolutely remarkable and beautiful to see how nature reveals the design of the designer. I mean, think about how things fit so perfectly together. Right now, the earth is about 93 million miles away from the sun. But if it were 1 million miles closer or further away, there'd be no life on earth. Right now, earth is tilted at 23 degrees and the angle. But if it were more or less, our seasons would be completely out of whack. And so all of this really, I think, points to the wisdom of a designer, which manifests his mighty power through the glory of nature. But more than a planet or a tree, the human person is called to manifest the glory of God. In fact, St. Augustine once wrote, he said, Men go abroad to wonder at the heights of mountains, at the huge waves of the sea, at the long courses of the rivers, at the vastness of the ocean, at the circular motions of the stars, and they pass by themselves without wondering. It's really not only our bodies, but ultimately our souls, our intellect and our free will, which not only set us apart from the animals and make us in the image and likeness of God, but that's what's called, that's what's called forth to show the glory of God. But here's the tricky thing about human beings. We can choose whether or not God's glory is going to shine forth in us. You know, a fish can't decide whether or not to glorify God. It simply glorifies God by being a fish, by swimming around in the ocean. But we can choose whether or not to glorify God, to become the saints that he's created us to be. St. Irenaeus said, the glory of God is man fully alive. And so God receives the greatest glory when we're living as we ought to live, truly alive for him, in him, and through him. I think that, you know, most people go through life asking themselves, what makes me happy? You know, they get up in the morning and wonder how they can please themselves that day. And they make decisions based on whatever maybe boosts their ego or brings them delight or is convenient or profitable for them. But a true Christian awakens in the morning to the thought of what will glorify God today? They make decisions not based on what pleases them, but what pleases God, the good God whom they love more than anything. Malcolm Muggeridge converted because he saw a woman given completely over to the glory of God. God's love, compassion, and heroic strength was visible because Mother Teresa had given herself completely over to him. It's really, like they they could see God in her. Would people be able to see God manifest in you? Now, I'm not just talking about being a nice person, right? Mother Teresa wasn't always nice. In fact, she could be quite sharp. Like I think of when the time that at the National Prayer Breakfast, she went right up to President Clinton and told him that abortion was, was wrong. But yet, nevertheless, even if she wasn't nice, she, had, she was glorifying God because she was totally yielded to him. She lived out that famous Jesuit motto, ad majorem de gloriam, all for the greater glory of God. So what's preventing you from letting God's glory shine through you? 
What's preventing you from living for his glory alone and not just for our own little plans, our little pleasures, our little egos? God wants to show the world his glory, his majesty, his mercy, his love, but he can't do it on his own. He wants to use you and I. Now, again, this doesn't mean that we all go away and become monks. It means that every aspect, even the small aspects of our life, is lived in a way that pleases him, out of love for him and for our neighbor. Not too long ago, we received some relics, which are bones of saints, that would be placed into our altar here at St. Jude's when the bishop comes in December. And one of those relics is of St. Gabriel of the Sorrowful Virgin. And he's got quite a story of finally, finally living for the glory of God and not his own glory. So he was born in Italy in the mid-1800s, and he suffered much grief in his young life when his mother died and then two of his sisters died. And all of this grief really made him turn away from God. He figured that, you know, if life is short, he might as well just make the most of it and live it up and have as much pleasure as he possibly could. And so as a young teen, he was very much the ladies' man. He got the nickname of the dancer for his, uh, what he did at parties, and he would often have several girlfriends at one time. Sometimes it was reported that he would spend over an hour just combing his hair to make sure he looked absolutely perfect. Now, he wasn't an evil young man, you know, certainly not wicked, but one who was really living for his own glory and not for God's. But God was trying to get his attention. When he was 13, he got deathly ill, and while he was on his deathbed, he promised, he's like, Lord, Lord, I'll live for you if I only recover. And he recovered and promptly forgot about that promise. Another time when he was a teen, he was out hunting with his friends, and one time a stray bullet just whizzed right past his ear and just narrowly missed killing him. And once again, at that, he was shocked, frightened, and he said, Lord, okay, I'll live for you. But once again, forgot that promise. Finally, finally an epidemic of sickness struck his town, and the town's leaders decided to lead a procession through the town with a statue of Our Lady, begging God to end the sickness. Gabriel was watching this procession pass by when a voice spoke to his heart and said, Gabriel, how long will you live for yourself and not for me? Finally, finally, God got his attention. So he left the procession immediately and had a very long conversation with a priest who urged him to begin a prayer life and to begin to live his life for Christ. His everyday life became no longer about just living for the things of this world. It became about doing things out of love for God, whether big things or just mundane tasks like doing the dishes. He quickly advanced in the spiritual life, ended up joining a religious community, and died as a very holy religious Catholic brother. But what a great example of somebody who for a long time was living really for his own glory, just for his own life. And God was inviting him to so much more. So if you feel like you're ready to live your life for the glory of God, here are three things that you can do real quick to live it out. First, in your daily prayer, don't just ask God to give you stuff, but also tell the Lord that you're giving him your life without reservation. Second, when you're making a decision, ask what will please the Lord and not what will be most pleasing to you. Now, sometimes the two are the same, but sometimes they're not. And third, Consider how you use your time, your talents, and your treasure, and begin to use all three in ways that are pleasing to God. My friends, God's glory is manifest in all his works, but it's up to us if we're going to allow God's glory to shine through us. May his glory and majesty, his love and truth, be manifest in our lives, that we may be a living witness to his glory. 